You see, I really have wanted to make it so that people get the idea that these folks, who are eating their potatoes by the light of their little lamp, have tilled the earth themselves with these hands they are putting in the dish, and so it speaks of manual labor and that they have thus honestly earned their food. I wanted to give the idea of a wholly different way of life from ours, civilized people, so I certainly don't want everyone just to admire it or approve of it without knowing why. Those are the words that Vincent van Gogh wrote in April 1885 when he was in Nunen, to his brother, Theo, alluding to what today we can qualify as his first great work, The Potato Eaters. As everyone knows, Vincent was not a recognized painter in life. Many of his works were harshly judged by art critics of that time. This painting, full of dark tones, covered with rough and gloomy features, was no exception. If we focus on the classic aspects of the Academy, this is a work with a lot of mistakes. But Vincent's intention was not to make a mimesis, that is to say, a copy of reality in the aesthetic sense of the word, but to try to represent the emotional reality of the situation. This is what I think that happens with Bellatar's latest film, The Turing Horse. While the various philosophical analyses that emerge from this film can be very interesting, and in fact they are the ones that abound, I think this analysis says much more about us than about the reality that Bellatar tries to show. For this reason, I propose to do a kind of analysis within a historical vision, something like trying to understand the behavior or act of these characters within what could be their own reality. However, before concluding, I will also make a brief comment related to the philosophical aspect of the film. Despite the fact that Bellatar prefers not to give his films a specific time, the connection with the anecdote about Nietzsche and the horse forces us to place towards the end of the 19th century. Although we could establish some points about the geographical space and the context in which Vincent painted his peasants, I'm actually just gonna keep the parallelism with what we can directly watch on his work. Besides, this video is more about Italy and the movie I'm talking about. It is, rather, the central theme in Vincent's painting and one of the protagonists of Tar's film with which I would like to start. I'm talking about potatoes. Yes, potatoes. While the history of the potato is very interesting, I'm not going to dig up into its arrival to Europe and other historical issues that are irrelevant for my purpose. But I'm interested in highlighting two things. On one hand, the potato is a very nutritious food. On the other hand, it is a root vegetable that doesn't require too much to grow. It can easily develop in many types of soil. These two peculiarities makes the potato a perfect food so as not to spend too much on its production and, in the context of which we are talking, feed rural population with very low resources. For us, depending on how it's cooked, potatoes are almost always a very tasty meal mashed potatoes, french fries, baked potatoes, gnocchi, etc. But in addition to this range of possibilities when cooking potatoes, it is not a food that we consume on a daily basis. Both in the film and in Vincent's painting, this is not the case. Both works represent, in different ways, what is a daily situation in the life of these peasants, eating boiled potatoes. For Vincent's painting, that moment almost in the dark while eating, means a normal day, an exact moment of something they do on a daily basis. Bellatar, on the other hand, shows us the same thing but over the course of six days, capturing how overwhelming it is to eat the same thing every day. However, continuing with this parallelism between these two works, I believe that the author's intentions differ. While Van Gogh tries to show a reality that, in our eyes, civilized people can be seen as dark, dirty and miserable, he places an emotional value on rural work. As he mentions in the letter to his brother, the scene he is painting is something honorable. The peasants are gathered at the table eating the fruit of their manual labor. For Vincent, this scene is worthy of being proud, of separating himself from modern life, from the city. 
The film doesn't pretend to portray this situation with pride or with a romanticized vision. Belatar tries to show rather the contextual reality of these two people, showing that no matter how much pride you may want to find in them eating what they have grown, the monotony is terrifying, the loneliness is overwhelming and the reality is very, very tough. The characters don't distinguish between manual labor and intellectual or any other kind of labor. They only know manual labor. I mean, working the land or working with their hands is the only thing they know. Unlike painting, a film is not static. Throughout the six days that the film presents us, we can see that the characters gradually stop eating. While this serves as a kind of progress to tell us what the film wants to say, on many levels, although its director himself pretends to believe that he doesn't want to give any kind of message, if we remove the philosophical sense that is given in the film, this can be seen as the already known deficiency in the diet of these poor peasants. Following this line, one could think of some other scenes that help us find these looks or behaviors that may be strange to our present day. One of them is, for example, sitting and looking out the window at different times of the day. There is nothing out there and yet, do they find more entertainment in that nothingness than in what they have inside their home? Or is it just another daily matter, a habit? In addition to sharing the potato as a central element of both works, we also have the lamp as the only source of light in the home, the gathering of people at lunchtime, but also, if you look closely, as Richard Raskin mentioned in his article on the Vincent signature and the values embodied in the potato eaters, none of the people in the painting seems to be comfortable with what they are doing, much less looking at each other. The gaze of the characters in Van Gogh's painting is something that is also reflected in Tar's film. During those six days, the characters hardly share eye contact. She dresses him and undresses him almost without looking at him as if she were in some kind of automatic state. In the same way, they eat, they sleep and so on, without looking at each other. Again, while Vincent's intention is to show something a little more brotherly under the warm light of the lamp, the scenes ends up being just as cool as what the characters in the touring horse shows to us. Leaving Vincent aside for this video, I would like to name a couple more observations before moving on to the philosophical section. Let us remember that we are located at the end of the 19th century, almost in the transition with the 20th century. During this time, what is known as the Second Industrial Revolution takes place. We don't see any of this in the film in terms of large machinery or large mobilizations but there are some indicators that something is changing. Consider that Italy, at the end of the 19th century, was still a country with a large percentage of rural population, however, the scene illustrated by Bellatar only shows us two people who are living almost totally isolated from everything known, with a few interventions by other characters. One of them, the one about the man who comes to get alcohol, is rather the philosophical touch of the film, and I will talk about him in a while. But the second involves a group of very noisy gypsies who come to ask for some water. The visit of these characters leaves us with two things to highlight. In the middle of the intervention of these people, when her daughter runs to throw them out of their property, one of the gypsies invites her to go with them to America. As everyone knows, between the transition of these two centuries, Italy was one of the countries where many of its citizens decided to go to America, in many cases under promises of better job opportunities and better living conditions. Argentina, for example, was one of the countries that received a large number of Italians. I find it interesting the way the film brings up the issue of emigration, because the daughter and the father seem not even to notice these words. As Manfredini and Breschi mentioned in an article rather devoted to lonely life in rural Italy, migration was the last resort for these people. Leaving home, if not strictly necessary, was not an option. And, precisely, this is what happens later, when the well runs out of water. It is only when there is no other option that they decide to leave their home. 
They try to leave, but they can't. The conditions are pretty tough for both of them. The other interesting point in the intervention of the gypsies is the gift they give to the woman for the water they ask for. A book. While this book opens up more of a philosophical or religious debate, this is not what I'm interested in discussing. Belotar has said that the film can be compared to the Christian myth of creation. But inversely, this film is more about destruction, which I find extremely interesting. However, continuing with the historical perspective, I find it curious to note that the woman can read. She barely can, but she knows how. She can understand the words in the book and this seems a bit accurate to me, because rural school in Italy, as Luca Montecchi says, is something that could be feasible at the time the film shows, but that also means just elementary school. Finally, to end this section, I would like to add that all the cinematic aspects, the slow camera movements, the relatively few shots there are, considering the length of the film, the black and white photography that is not entirely a contrast but rather a grayscale, I mean all these things and more that perfectly go along with what the author's intention is and what, for me, this historical perspective is, the slow day by day of two people living in rural Italy at the end of the 19th century. We wait, we are bored. No, don't protest. We are bored to death. There's no denying it. Good. A diversion comes along and what do we do? We let it go to waste. In an instant, all will vanish and we'll be alone once more, in the midst of nothingness. There are many philosophical analyses of this film all over the internet. I don't pretend to say much more than they do, so I'll try to keep this part much shorter than the previous one. There is an obvious connection to Nietzsche's philosophy in this film, apart from the anecdote at the beginning. The interruption of the character who arrives almost violently to ask for alcohol makes me think a lot about the Nietzschean idea about the Superman, and also in that feeling of intellectual, moral and ethical superiority that usually surrounds the philosophy of Nietzsche. This character reminds me of something like the figure of the Nietzschean Zarathustra who claims a past always better than the present, which is corrupted by modern men. But it should also be noted that this character is presented to us kinda in a controversial way. He is a man who almost violently breaks into the house, sits down and begins to speak, while asking for alcohol. This tells us something important. That supposedly deep philosophical speech comes out from the mouth of a drunk man. However, about Nietzsche and the Turing horse, I think there is already too much said. Overall, the film shows a kind of density, of existentialism almost bordering on nihilistic ideas, which is terrifying. Just like Waiting for Godot, that well-known work by Samuel Beckett, where the characters are waiting for something or someone that will never appear, the family of the Turin horse also lives in the waiting, in the mere inertia of living. At one point in the movie, near the end, the father says, tomorrow we will try again while his whole world falls apart. We should eat, he says to his daughter, after they both lost all appetite. The world of this film is an inevitable abyss. It is pure darkness. From the beginning, like Dante's famous entry into hell, the film leads us towards the loss of all hope, towards self-abandonment and death. A tired horse, tired of pulling the cart, resigning to starving, a father and a daughter who are losing all will to live, to continue in that infinite and miserable monotony, the nothingness that manifests itself as the only daily entertainment, the mighty wind that never ceases, and finally the emptiness of the world, already dry, that precedes the final darkness. This last element is nothing more than the prelude to the logically inexplicable absence of light towards the end. Against all will, against all effort, as well as the incessant wind, darkness eats the screen. It is the inevitable end of everything.
As I said at the beginning of the video, I think that the historical contribution is another viable way to analyze this film. The philosophical perspective, which is extremely interesting, seems to me to say more about us than about what the film tries to represent. A historical perspective, although I am aware that is not the intention of the film, and I don't attribute the category of historical film to it, rather allows us to try to understand the world of these characters in their context. Anyway, taking up Vincent's words, all these visions, historical or philosophical, and even the film itself, comes from us, civilized people, from the tools we have to do this. The world of this family is dark, and they, to some extent, know it. But they don't have or know any other way out. They just have to wait, even in the dark. Let's remember what the father says to the first visitor at the end of his philosophical speech. Nonsense. 